Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Summer Henschel, originally from Chilton, Wisconsin. I'm a graduate from the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences with a major in dairy science. I am now a second year student in the School of Veterinary Medicine. I am pleased to introduce Courtney Halbach, Outreach Specialist with the Dairyland Initiative. Today, Courtney will be teaching us about the one-of-a-kind outreach program from the UW-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine and how more than 84,000 people worldwide have used resources from the program to ensure the well-being of their cows. Courtney joined the Food Animal Production Medicine team in October 2013. Her areas of interest include calf and adult cow barn design, positive pressure to ventilation systems, and automatic milking facility design. Courtney graduated from Carleton College in environmental studies with a focus in food and agriculture and obtained her Master of Business Administration from Edgewood College. Please welcome Courtney Halbach. Thank you for the introduction, Summer, and thank you to Badger Talks Live for the opportunity to celebrate June Dairy Month and to talk about the Dairyland Initiative which is a one of a kind outreach program provided by the School of Veterinary Medicine. What is the state of dairy cattle housing um, in today's current climate? If you've driven around mm -hmm. Wisconsin, um, you may have seen these um, nice red little barns outlining the uh, Wisconsin countryside and you know those uh, were the way farmers used to house their cattle in the past and some continue to do so but what we're seeing is a transition um, as herds expand and want to provide a more comfortable indoor climate for their cattle to what we call freestall housing. Um, from the USDA did a survey back in 2016 looking at the current housing facilities um, that producers are adopting and almost uh, more than 70% of Wisconsin herds are now housed in freestall housing and I believe that is going to be um, the direction of the industry. One of the questions we get asked is do cows really like to be inside or would they rather be out at pasture? Um, a study done out of the University of British Columbia looked at cows um, preferences for being out on pasture and um, when that was during the day and some of the reasons why that may be. Um, and so in this top graph here, you'll see on the left hand side, the percent of time that cows spent on pasture and down below you'll see the time of day. And what you can observe is that cows spent the majority of their time inside during the daylight hours and then had a preference to go outside at night. And why could this be? Um, on the chart in the lower um, part of the slide, you'll see again that time on pasture on the left hand side with THI, which is the temperature humidity index um, down below. And what you'll see is that as the temperature got hotter, cows spent less time outdoors and more time indoors. So um, what this tells us is that uh, if we provide cows with proper thermal comfort like shade, um, easy access to food and water and appropriate heat abatement methods, indoor housing can be just as attractive or more so than outdoor access. The facility design has a huge impact on the overall cow well-being. Um, there's multiple ways that her health is affected um, by facility design and um, one of those major issues that we as a program are often dealing with is lameness, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Other things that we look at are rates of mastitis, 
fresh cow health and performance. And a fresh cow is a fresh cow who has recently calved and has just started um, milking production. Calves are also influenced by facility design and because we wanna make sure that they have a good start to their life and are set up for success in the future. And then heat stress for all aged animals, um, which exp is especially true today, even though it might be raining outdoors, it's still hot. So how did the Dairy Land Initiative come to be? Well, back in 2010, uh, there was a book that had a lot of this information available, but it wasn't easily accessible for people. You had to purchase the book. The book was written and there weren't, um, it wasn't able to be updated regularly. Um, so my colleagues, Dr. Nigel Cook and Dr. Ken Nordland decided to huddle together and figure out a way to make that information more accessible because we had a lot of producers and farmers asking, how can I improve the comfort of my cows? And also consumers asking, well, how are cows being housed? Do they have a good living environment? And consumers have a lot of say in how the industry um, cares for our animals. Of course, um, dairy producers and all of those who care for um, the cows are always advocating on behalf of the cow and wanting to see her in a, a, an optimal health state um, and just like consumers. And so the consumers were also driving at this time and consider and continue to do so um, are seeking improvements in dairy cattle housing, but also sustainability. We started with the Baldwin, Wisconsin IDEA, which is a grant program from the university that helps programs like the Dairyland Initiative take clinical and um, information and research at, from the university, from um, our colleagues and faculty members here, and provide that to the public um, to help foster engagement um, and improvement in our lives. And so since we launched in 2010, uh, we have ongoing support from other industry um, entities that are very concerned about the welfare of our dairy cattle and believe that our opportunities for education and consultation support to dairy farmers and other industry professionals um, help improve the well being of our cows. The dairy, um, the decisions made on a dairy is not just made by a dairy farmer. The dairy farmer has so many people on their team. You have the veterinarians coming in and helping with the health of the animal. You have nutritionists trying to figure out the right feed supplements or you know the what to what ingredients should I put on my salad for the most optimal meal. Then you've got the lenders offering money for the farmers to make investments into the dairy and you've got the construction pr professionals and equipment dealers um, that are trying to sell products to help um, maximize cow comfort. And then we've our students here at the vet school, as well as across campus, and our many extension officers and educators that are all trying to help the dairy farmer make the best decision for their cows. So one of our main draws are our workshops that we host biannually. Most of the time they've been in person, but with the pandemic, we've gone virtual. So here are some pre-pandemic photos um, of industry professionals from all over the world um, gathering to share ideas and troubleshoot real life uh, examples of barn design. So we'll give them a issue where there's this farm that would like to improve their facility for their cows that are about to calve, which we call the transition cow facility, or maybe they want to add housing for their young stock, like their newborn calves or 
their heifers who aren't producing milk yet. And so they come together and I purposely split them up so that they have to work with people from other, other parts of the industry to come up for the best solution for the cow. And to date, we've had almost 2000 attendees attend our 48 workshops. But our, our bread and butter of the Dairyland Initiative is our website, which is completely free um, to anybody uh, around the world. And it's split up into three different modules. The housing module is an area where we focus primarily on facility design for all aged animals. So we'll look at all the different components from calf barn housing to adult cow housing. And then we also have a module on uh, lameness. So how can we improve the hoof health of our dairy herds? And lastly, uh, we are currently working on our calf health module, which has more of a veterinary focus where we're looking at ways to diagnose, well, first prevent um, respiratory disease and then diagnose respiratory disease in a timely manner um, so that calves have the best um, start to life as possible. So feel free to Google the Dairyland Initiative and it should pop right up in your search engine. So last I checked, we had over 85,000 visitors to our website um, since we did our new website design in 2016. It's available in stable groups. So what that means is we don't wanna intermix um, cows in separate groups over and over. Um, just like, you remember in high school when there was the different cliques um, and you kind of just had your friend groups? Well, cows have hierarchy as well. There are the dominant cows and the subordinate cows. And those dominant cows are usually the older ones with the subordinate ones being the younger ones. And cows also have friends. So you can see cows that grew up together, uh, stay um, together in the pens when they're older. So uh, we don't wanna cause undue stress by continually mixing up uh, their groups, especially during that time, that critical time before calving. So um, we create these socially stable groups to keep um, all the cows happy. And then we want to provide sufficient ventilation and heat abatement. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the importance of ventilation and that's no different for a dairy cow's health. So we have recommendations for how many air changes an hour is needed for cows in the winter, which is four air changes per hour and 40 or more air, air changes per hour in the summer. Um, and this can be done either by building very open barns to try and maximize the prevailing winds coming into the barn or through mechanical design where you use fans to exhaust air or push air in to the barn at the desired rate. But then we also need to focus on heat abatement. Heat abatement is more than just ventilation. Um, that's, you know, heat abatement is targeting cow cooling. So um, this is providing uh, soakers um, in the milking center or holding area to cool cows or fans over the stalls. Our big focus is a comfortable place to rest. Um, we want to make sure that um, cows have a nice place to rest that um, allows them to get as much rest as they need, but also doesn't cause injuries to them. And of course, there needs to be plenty of feed and water, so easy access in the pen um, to feed or water without having to compete for those areas or um, have pens that are so congested and crowded that cows can't get to those areas. And then we don't want cows to be out of the pen for very long for milking. So, um, you know, we want cows to be cows and cows like to eat and rest and socialize. So 
they can do that in the pen and we want to keep them that way. So we'll size groups so that cows aren't, aren't out of the pen for milking um, for a given amount of time per day. And then lastly, we want to reduce the risk and spread of disease. So um, if we have sick cows, we're going to put the sick cows in a special area in the farm so that they can get the attention that they need um, and also not expose other herd mates to um, whatever they're fighting. So um, we'll have special pens that are like a, a hospital pen for those cows in need. There's uh, just like humans have their daily rituals and what they need. And you hear doctors say, oh, humans need eight hours of rest per day. Well, cows need 12 hours of rest per day. So um, uh, we looked at, you know, how much time do cows spend doing different cow things? Um, and this is a breakdown of what a cow does in 24 hours. So she spends the majority of her day lying down um, and another chunk eating. I mean, when you're producing milk, you're definitely hungry. There's also time spent socializing in the alley and drinking water or maybe just chilling in the stall standing up. So those are what we consider the necessary things that a cow has to do in a day. So she has three leftover hours. Um, that's kind of like free time. And so what that free time would be, would be milking. So we want to make sure that cows aren't out of the pen for more than three hours in the day. And that we do that by um, reducing group sizes so that they can move in and out of the parlor quickly. One of the issues uh, that we've been struggling as a dairy industry is lameness or hoof foot health. There are two videos playing on the screen. The one in the upper corner is a cow um, that we, we like how she strides. She has easy movement. She's not favoring any of her legs or feet. Her head's nice and high, her, her back is straight. She's perked up, she looks happy. Whereas the cow down below here is obviously struggling. Um, she's, she's favoring her one leg um, and it just it's really hard to see her hurt that much. Um, so we looked at various studies at, to see what the lameness rates are. Uh, Wisconsin back in 2016 um, for herds that were averaging 11 gallons of milk per cow per day, they had a lameness prevalence of about 13%, which is considerably down from what it was in 2003. Um, this is because of housing improvements and other hoof health management tools that are used better now like um, hoof trimming and foot bath use. And so this is something we are still improving on and we hope to get down again um, with continued advancements in housing and um, hoof management. So um, this isn't the ideal number. We're going more towards that, but you can see progress here in Wisconsin, which we like to think has come out of our housing recommendations. One of those things that makes hoof health so important is the bedding surface. So you can see here this cow as she's getting up in the stall and walking around, how her hoof sinks into that sand. Um, on other surfaces that are harder, she doesn't have that cush. And so um, we recommend having a very soft bed, which can either be from sand, which is most common, or um, dried manure solids in different parts of the area um, of the United States. And then in places like Finland, they use peat moss. Um, a, a colleague of mine, um, Dr. Solano, she did a study in Canada looking at 
the effect of different resting surfaces on line time. So over here on the left, you can see the hours per day. And down here on the bottom, you've got um, the different types of bedding surfaces. So you've got sand, um, rubber crumb mattresses, a different type of mattress, concrete with bedding on top, or water beds. And if you think back to the previous slide about the time budget of a cow, the sand is what gets us closest to the necessary 12 hours of resting time per day. So really, cows are just living life on a beach. And I mean, who can complain about that? There's more to it than just the stall resting surface. Every detail about the stall has recommendations. So how that loop is, where this bar is. And one thing that we're focused on is the width and the length of uh, the stall surface. And we want to make sure that it's sized based on the body weight of the animal occupying the stalls. So like think about it in, a, in human terms and beds uh, with kids, you put a kid in a kid bed or a twin bed. And then as you grow up, you might uh, and get a little bit bigger, you go to full queen and king size beds. So no different for dairy cows. We uh, increase the size as they get bigger. And this helps reduce lameness and prevents injuries on these cows. Then there's more to resting behavior than just the bedding surface and the size of the stall. There's also ventilation and air speeds within the stall. So if you think about the barn, you have the overall barn environment that can be reduced to just the pen which then can be further reduced to that one stall that that cow was occupying. And so our mission is to provide the best environment for every cow in each stall. One thing that we've seen related to resting behavior is that when a cow is heat stressed or hot, her amount of time um, spent lying down decreases. So again, we've got the temperature humidity index over here on the left with the days on the bottom. And what you can see is that as the days get hotter, the cows spent less time on average lying down. So at about 67, they were close to 10 hours of rest per day. But once we got up to 78 degrees, we were as low as six hours a day, which increases um, hoof health issues. And just as a just a reference point, at about 68 degrees, that's when cows start to feel heat stress. So it might feel good for us, but cows are already hot. Now, why would cows spend less time lying down um, when they're hot? Um, well. The answer to that is because um, cows need to stand up um, and increase the amount of body area they have to dissipate heat. So when cows lie down, they, their body temperature starts to increase and then they stand up and it will start to decrease and so on. But their body temperature increases faster lying down then it does when uh, that and it, it decreases less um, at the less rate than when they're standing up or when they're lying down. So um, we want to try and maximize the amount of time that cows are lying down in the stall and minimize the amount of times they have to get up to cool down. So one thing we've done um, is looking at fan placement. So you can see here um, a fan being tested and you can see the fog coming out and it's blowing really fast air, but there's this area beneath the fan where there's no airspeed. Even though it's directly below the fan, nothing's happening. So 
we've put together recommendations on how to space the fans so that the fan here on the left has enough time to get that fast moving air under the next fan in line. Um, so you can see here fans in this freestall that are closely spaced together um, above all rows of stalls. And then here on the right is a bedded pack um, where cows are in line with those fans. So um, they love lying down, they love getting fast moving air, and we can provide that with fans over the stalls. We can't forget about our youngins though, those beautiful calves. Um, a lot of our facilities for calves are naturally ventilated. So we primarily rely on wind coming in. Um, but then my colleague, Dr. Ken Nordland invented what we call positive pressure tube systems. So we've got two types of positive pressure tube systems here. One is for the winter that provides the minimum four air changes per hour without creating a draft on the calves so they don't get chilled. And then in the summer, we've got these big capacity um, tubes that provide fast moving air at a higher ventilation rate. Uh, when this idea came um, out of a study by our group looking at um, the micro environment of a calf and uh, you again, you know, thinking back to this past year and the importance of clean air, uh, you can see that um, a well ventilated barn has less um, uh, bacteria than what was in a calf barn without proper ventilation. So the idea with these tubes was how can we bring fresh air into the calf microenvironment? So there is a fan located on the end of the barn that only brings in fresh air that's evenly distributed along the length of the tube and these holes are properly designed to shoot air into where the calves are living without creating a draft. So when they're lying down, they don't feel a thing, but they're getting all of the benefits of fresh air. And this has been widely accepted across uh, the world. A recent um, study in 2017 from the University of Minnesota confirmed the importance of these positive pressure tube systems. Um, it was seen that a calf had an 80% more of a chance to be diagnosed with a respiratory disease if there wasn't a positive pressure tube system in the barn. So um, not only have dairy farmers from word of mouth seen the positive effect on calf health with these systems, but research has further proved the need um, and the importance of these systems providing um, a healthy environment for our calves to grow up in. So what's next? Um, you guys have made of her, might have heard of automated milking systems or robotic milkers. And that's where cows never have to leave the pen in order to be milked. So this is a picture um, of a farm that we visited for a trial um, looking um, at wait time. So how long cows wait to be milked. And you can see very similar elements to um, a conventional uh, herd where cows are resting in sand bedded free stalls. This is a mechanically ventilated barn. So um, fast moving air over the resting space is provided by these things, which we call baffles. Um, and then you've got cows that can walk freely between where they eat, um, the alleyways and their resting space. And they can go up to be milked at whatever time of day that they want. Um, and you can see how nice and open this area is for cows to go up to the milker. There's 
We want to limit the amount of competition here um, and just make it a open and inviting facility. I also just want to point out, um, it's kind of funny how where cows decide to rest. Um, yes, some of these cows have uh, preferences for their stalls, like when you walk into a room and you always sit at a certain desk, well, the, some of these cows have a certain stall that they like to sit in as well. Um, but you can also see that, excuse me, that they're avoiding this outside row of stalls. Um, cows tend to seek shade um, and perceive light as heat. So um, uh, you can see that cows are sitting in what they see as the darker parts of the barn versus along that outside row of stalls where the sunlight is coming in. Here's a, a video of a automated milking uh, facility. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at is, you know, how long does a cow wait to be milked? This cow right here in the upper left hand corner, she wants to be milked, but this cow wants to try and get in. So what she's doing is she kept trying to push on the cow in front of her, but she was never able to displace this cow from being milked um, because she wasn't able to get behind her shoulder and push her back. So instead of this cow who may be a subordinate cow being pushed back and never being able to get milked because of the dominant cow in the um, herd, um, by having this long um, gate here, she has access and priority to the milking unit. Um, but you can see here this cow, um, she can go into the milking pen um, where she's waiting to be milked. And then when the cow leaves the robot where she gets a little treat, um, she can come and eat food at the feed bunk and then go back um, to her stalls for a nice lie down. Here's just another um, example of a automated milking facility where gates control the access um, to the milking robot. Um, and so one of you know, the questions that has been raised with these systems is um, whether these automated milking systems can be more profitable than conventional milking systems. And um, they could be with increased milk production per cow and labor savings. So our role um, as the Dairyland Initiative is about how we can design these facilities um, to maximize cow comfort, limit the amount of time um, that they are up milking, but also um, how to reduce the amount of times that people are in the pen because we really don't want to disturb cows from doing their natural habits. So um, a lot of um, the upcoming research, you know, that I'm doing, the data I'm analyzing right now is looking at labor management in AMS facilities and how the design of the barn not only improves cow comfort and um, labor efficiency, um, so stay tuned, uh, but I think um, the future of the dairy industry, you'll start to see more of these robotic milking systems as well as other technologies being adopted. So I greatly, again, appreciate the time you took out of your busy days um, to learn about the Dairyland Initiative and ways that our program is improving cow comfort worldwide. And I hope you guys remember to go and get a glass of milk or a scoop of ice cream to celebrate June Dairy Month. Thanks. Courtney, thanks so much. Uh, what a, a wealth of information you have. And thanks for serving uh, dairy farmers, not just in Wisconsin, but around the world, it sounds like. Uh, yeah. uh, hello, everybody. Fran Paleo, Moyer Badger Talks producer. Feel free to post any questions in the chat that you have uh, for Courtney. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you, Courtney. Um, in terms of volunteer opportunities with the Dairyland Initiative, are there any? There are no direct volunteer opportunities, um, but we see a lot of 
interest from college graduates of the university, as well as other industry professionals who are more than willing um, to take our ideas and apply them on the farms that they work with, and then share their experiences with us to let us know if um, our recommendations are working or if something needs to be improved. Oh, that makes sense. And what about for students? What is the role of students in the program? Yeah, so our fourth year students get at the vet school here, they kind of get an in-depth um, uh, experience of going out to a, a couple of dairy farms and going through these troubleshooting questions like, um, is there a high rate of incident, uh, lameness incidents in the herd? And if so, what could be causing that? Is it um, a bad resting surface? Is the ventilation not quite right? So cows are standing up more, are cows spending too much time out of the pen? Um, et cetera. So we've got uh, this as a part of the fourth year curriculum. Um, but then Summer uh, was just on and introduced myself. She and Alexis are helping with a summer heat stress study where we are looking at line behavior and airspeed and ventilation rates in both naturally ventilated herds and mechanically ventilated herds in Wisconsin. And what we hope to get out of that is further, a further idea of what's happening um, in our state and then ways to improve the well being of the cows on those farms and other farms around the world. Great. Sounds like important work for our uh, veterinary students as well. So, uh, so one question um, that has come up, I know, on some of our social channels is also about exercise for cows. So now many of us own dogs, right? Or we think of ourselves, like we all need to get out and walk several miles a day and we need to like get our heart rates up. So what's the scoop with cows? Like, do they need exercise? Cause that's not something that, you know we've really talked about today. No, so great question. Um, cows do need to move around. So that's why um, these free stall facilities are nice because they can move about the uh, pen with no um, impediment. But um, going out, so, like when we see cows at pasture, they're not necessarily getting exercise. They're working to eat. So um, when they're outside, they are working to find food. And most of their time then is spent eating versus lying down. So when they come inside into the barn, we provide them with that food so they don't have to spend as much time searching uh, for food and can spend more time lying down. But they're pretty sedimentary uh, creatures. Uh, you can tell that a cow is happy when she is lying down and chewing her cud. That girl couldn't have more care in the world than just relaxing and enjoying her cud. So if you ever see a cow and you want to know if she's happy, look for her being content and chewing her cud. So no future of treadmills in the cow barns. <laughs> no, we, but we do track activity. We have Fitbits for cows so we can see uh, if they're, what their um, movement is. And that's one of the things, you know, that we are looking at in our study, but uh, we want them lying down and, and they want to be lying down as well. Got it. Great. And so, Courtney, we like to ask of our speakers uh, a little bit about your personal background and how you ended up in the position you're in. Can you just talk a little bit about your your career development thus far? Yeah. Um, my parents had a dairy farm just outside of Tucson, Arizona, until I was eight. And then we moved to Madison, where my dad got a job at the university and um, when I went to college, I was like, I want absolutely nothing to do with the dairy industry. That was my past. I want to, you know, forge something new. Uh, but when I was at Carleton College, I had the opportunity to study abroad and I chose to work on a dairy farm in Luxembourg. And one morning when I was uh, bringing the cows in for milking, I just 
felt this overwhelming sense of peace and calm. And I can't explain it. It was just a magical moment. And I couldn't have been happier. Um, and I just knew then that my life's purpose was to work with dairy cows. And I didn't know how that was going to play out. Uh, but I knew that my career was going to be in um, the dairy industry. So I finished up my senior year at college. Um, after I graduated, this opportunity came up with the Dairyland Initiative. And I really loved the aspect of improving cow welfare and offering um, ways to see how we can make farmsteads more sustainable. And so from there, I've just been learning more and more about housing and lameness prevention. And I hope to continue to do so for the rest of my career. I couldn't that's love really, cows more. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And I, I always think back and hearken back as I'm talking to my students and my, my own kids, uh, that city slickers moment where they say, you need to find your one thing right? Your purpose in life. And it sounds like you've really found it, Courtney. So that's pretty cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us today. And everybody, please tune in Tuesday, July 13th. So we're going to skip next week for the July 4th holiday, but we'll be back July 13th at noon, where we're going to be welcoming Stephen Wright. And we're going to be talking to him about the success of his recent novel, The Coyotes of Carthage, uh, and his dual career as an associate law professor on the UW-Madison campus, as well as a fiction writer. Be sure to visit us at badgertalks.edu where you can see the upcoming schedule of live talks. You can sign up for our email list. Please consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are supported by a grant from the Alumni Association. So we appreciate those don donations to keep the free programs going. And visit our website also to search over the roster of over 400 speakers that we have listed that are available and happy to give talks around the state, both virtually and soon in person. Thanks for tuning in everybody and we'll look forward to seeing you back on the 13th. Thanks.